Right, hi and welcome everyone to the next in our series of online lunchtime learning webinars. This one is our Mind, Physical Activity and Mental Health webinar. Um, obviously at a time when more people than ever are suffering from poor mental health and we're becoming increasingly aware of how physical and uh, mental well-being are intrinsically linked, we're really pleased to be able to welcome Mind's Physical Activity lead, Hayley Jarvis, to join us today to kind of give us an overview of of mental health and physical activity and kind of links between the two and also some practical examples of um, opportunities where physical activity has been used to improve mental well-being. So over to you Hayley. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me today and to everyone for, for making the time to to prioritise uh, mental health. It's really, really important um, more than ever. So I am Hayley Jarvis. I'm the Head of Physical Activity at National Mind. And it's been my pleasure to head up our sport and physical activity programmes for the last six years from, from grassroots to, to elite sport, including Get Set to Go, which I'm going to share some of the learnings from that programme um, with you today. So I kind of see it from work, Hayley. I'm also a volunteer for Dudley Mind. I'm based up in the West Midlands, so I lead our um, uh, peer support programme, which is called Jolly Joggers, which is a mental wellbeing running group. And also... Um, I really use physical activity as a key tool in supporting my own mental, mental health problems. I've had long-standing mental um, health problems of my own, and it's one of the things in my toolkit. So who are Mind? We are the mental health charity. We stand shoulder to shoulder with people experiencing mental health problems, fighting for access to um, uh, for better services, but also for support. For, for respect and for you. So we work across England and Wales and we have a network of 120 independent local minds. So we're on the high street, we provide information, we campaign um, for access to services and we deliver programmes as well. And I'm really pleased that um, Diana's here from uh, Woke in Minds. So I was just gonna ask uh, Diana, if you wouldn't mind just unmuting yourself and, and saying hello and just explaining briefly what your local mind does in, in, in your community, if that's all right. Oh, you're on mute, Diana. Sorry about that. Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm relatively new to Woking Mind, having previously been at the council, and I recognise some of the attendees on this webinar. Um, so at the moment, Mind are doing a lot of online activity. Um, we're doing a bit of a mixture of online activity and some drop-in groups in the um, sort of creative space, bit of cookery, art, that kind of thing. One of the gaps that we've identified in, in the local Mind here in Woking is that we're not doing much in the physical activity activity space which is part of the reason why I'm here um, I've been in discussions with um, Laura Brooks just this morning actually at Sport in Mind who's attending and hopefully we'll follow up with Hayley after this to see how we can work more closely together and, and think about the provision in Woking so if any of you want to contact me I can pop my details in the chat but thanks for the introduction. Fantastic. And all of our local minds um, are unique. The services in their in the area are really uh, tailored to, to the local need, um, ranging from talking therapy, peer support, advocacy, crisis care, employment, housing. And as I say, it's absolute pleasure through my role. I get to work with so many. So Diana and I haven't met yet, but hopefully um, on the back of today, we'll be able to, to work together um, a, little, a little more. So during the, the brief time we've got to, together today, we're going to look at what is this role between physical activity and mental health and how it can support us to both stay well and live well when we have a mental health problem. Look at some of the barriers and things that are holding people back and make it tricky to get started. Explore some of those recommendations from, from Loughborough University and our wider programmes and really kind of think about how that might apply in your setting. And then signpost to it, we've got lots of resources and tools um, the team are creating things all of the time to, to help and lots of good practice so you don't have to start from scratch really want to say we're here to support you. Also we need to say this session isn't a replacement for mental health training so really sorry I'm not going to be able to teach you the signs and symptoms and, and things in, in the time that we've got today nor is it a sort of a therapy session or replacement for, for any kind of professional mental health support. So I will um, just pop in, in the chat box um, uh, some signposting um, should you need it during the session. You will also notice that I like to bring the slides up and down. It's helpful to see your faces when I can, um, but also just because it can be a bit tricky sometimes um, on Zoom with the technology. So I'm not the best, so fingers crossed. So I'm just gonna put some signposting. Just really wanna say, take care of yourself during the session today. 
and um, that's really um, important when we talk about mental health it can sometimes provoke some thoughts and feelings inside of us all so if you do need any signposting there's some um, support there in, in the chat box please do um, join in the conversation today on the chat um, I want to make it as interactive as I can and um, in this in this forum and as I say there will be a question and answer um, session at the end but before I kick off I just wanted you to have a bit of self-reflection really to think about how is your battery today how are you feeling um, thinking on uh, is your well-being or your energy levels as a scale a bit like your phone battery so one being perhaps on empty three is about halfway needing a top up five fully charged if you'd like to pop it in the chat where you're feeling that would be great you don't have to but just really wanted us to start by thinking about our own um, mental well-being and just thinking about uh, taking a moment to think about what might help us to refill our own energy levels or if we're already at five what might help us to get there so just really thinking about um, ourselves and our own mental well-being great we've got some fours in the the chat box a two hopefully we can get you up a little bit adrian three i think i'm probably a three looking forward to some lunch shortly that might perk me up um but i think it's really important that we've, we've all got mental health and we all need to to look after it okay and hopefully some of the tips and hints today will not only support you in your delivery but also think uh, might inspire you you in terms of ways to support your own mental health so as I alluded to, we've been working in this space for a little while at, at National Mind, and we really believe that sport and physical activity can help build our resilience, so it can help us to stay well, it creates that buffer, and actually reduces the risk of developing um, depression by up to 30%, so there's a really strong evidence base for it. It helps them support mental health recovery, so when we have a mental health problem or a mental um, health um, diagnosis, it, it can help us to live well with that um, mental health problem. And actually, it should be one of the primary interventions when we um, present to a doctor with mild or moderate depression. And also, we know the power of the badge and the power of sport can really help to tackle stigma and discrimination. So any football fans um, in the virtual room would know that we've been working with the EFL for um, three seasons now, with our logo on the back of the shirt, promoting positive conversations, and really helping people to get help and support. So we've been delivering a wide range of partners and uh, programmes, um, but also really trying to influence the policy landscape as well. So to really ensure that mental health is something that's everyone's responsibility in the sports sector. So for our mental health charter, many of the governing bodies, active partnerships, all sorts of leisure organisations have signed up to make a commitment to mental health, to look after their staff, but also to look after their uh, participants. We go across the pathway, we work in the elite sports space. But also more recently, we're working with the, the health sector to look at how we can embed physical activity in the mental health pathway as well. So really important that we look at this um, through um, a dual lens. And in partnership with UC, there were lots of different organisations. And if anyone's a an Arsenal, Chelsea or Spurs fan, you might have seen just yesterday we launched the Mind series, um, which is a series of fixture to support Mental, better mental health um, as part of the pre-season friendly. So lots of things going on and lots and lots of learning and insights um, to share with you. Cool. So to start with really um, a basis, I think it's really important to say, as we all know, we've, we've all got mental health just as we've got, got physical health. And up until a few years ago, I think very few people were willing to talk about it. Certainly when I joined Minds in this role, um, there was still a lot of stigma around mental health and we know we haven't completely broken that down but we've come a long way um, we now see everyone from a future king of the country to um, footballers uh, celebrities talking about their mental health so it's really really positive but I think you know we, it's fair to say it has been an incredibly challenging 15 months more more so than every any ever before and I think we've all realized how fragile our mental health can become um, frazzled, overwhelmed, exhausted, people talking about being on an emotional roller coaster, Zoom fatigue, surviving. It's, it has been a year um, like no other. So just really thinking that we're on this spectrum from um, good mental health. So we've all got good mental health where we're thriving, um, thinking about mental wellness. 
through on a continuum to, to mental illness or mental health problems, as we term it, um, at mind. And as we can see on the slide there, we know one in four adults um, experience mental health problems each year. And sadly, one in six children and young people have mental health problems. And that stat has been increasing year on year. So I think back in 2017, that was one in 10 children and young people. Sadly, the research from uh, NHS Digital last summer showed that it's one in six children and young people. So it's really important that, that we take it seriously. So when does it become a problem? When bad days turn into bad weeks, when our mental health gets in the way, when it stops us doing things that we enjoy, when it impacts on our work and our relationships, that's the time that we, we need to get some help and support from for it. And that's when it becomes a problem. So I'm not going to go into the, the ins and outs, but just really want to establish that it can happen to any of us, um, triggered by life events, period of ongoing stress. Um, it could be biological, social, psychological, environmental. Sometimes it just happens and we can't pinpoint a cause. But we all know that certainly this last year, um, our mental health has been impacted like never before. So just want to sort of establish that as a basis for, for today. But also just just a flag as well how our language around mental health can be really helpful, but can also sometimes trivialise it as well. So we've got this great vocabulary, and we talk about um, feeling a bit anxious or feeling a bit depressed. And I guess just to really flag for us to think about how we use those words, because um, feeling feeling a little bit low, a little bit down for a couple of days can feel very different to um, life not feeling like it's worth living not being able to leave our house, feeling numb and empty, and perhaps having a sort of a clinically diagnosed depression or anxiety. A little bit OCD, that seems to be a favourite one that we hear. People that like a structure and routine, and sometimes we throw those words around differently. So I think it's just something for us to be mindful of when we're, when we're talking about mental health as well, that we're aware of, of our language, okay? So moving on to COVID, just, you know, I could not talk about the, the impact um, that we've seen over, over the last year. And we know that it's going to leave a lasting scar on millions in the country. We've seen sadly a loss of life, the impact of the, the lockdowns, the loneliness and, and the impact of the, the recession. So at the start of lockdown, um, the very first lockdown, we saw a massive surge in people developing mental health problems for the very first time. Fortunately, that started to plateau as people started to sort of build up resilience and coping strategies. Um, but what we did find is that people with an existing mental health problem has told us that their mental health has got far worse this year. And that trend has been increasing. So people with uh, mental health problems uh, were more likely to catch COVID. And the more severe their mental health problem, the more likely they were to be hospitalised and sadly more likely to die because of COVID as a result. So we know before COVID, there was lots of inequalities, particularly with severe and enduring mental, um, mental illness. And so we know people have a shorter life expectancy of between 10 and 15 years uh, for severe mental illness. So thinking about schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, personality disorders. And um, we know mental health services have been really under-resourced. But what has happened with the pandemic is that we've seen people um, sort of living in poverty, people from BAME communities, have been doubly impacted um, in terms of their, their mental health and physical health. So it's something we need to really be aware of. Um, sorry to start on such a, a low, uh, but I think it's important that we're aware we've got through or we're coming through the physical health pandemic. It's really now about thinking about the, the, the second wave, which we term in the mental health emergency on, on the back of, of that. So we have lots of insight. You can, I'll send around the slides after so you can have a read of our, our report. We're actually just about to release a second report on the 12th of July with new research and new resources as well. So I have weaved in some of that in, into today. But just um, without going too much into COVID, just thinking about the impact of lockdown and loneliness. And this is where I think going forward, sport and physical activity has a huge role in bringing people together and combating that. And it's a you know, really positive activity. Um, but we know particularly for, for young people, uh, women, disabled people, people living in social housing or in shared occupancy, nowhere to escape has been a real challenge. We've seen particular challenges for people with eating disorders and um, OCD during, during lockdown um, and a lot of unhealthy coping strategies as well. So over or under eating, 
using alcohol or even illegal drugs. Self-harm has, has certainly been something that's been creeping up um, um, during the lockdown as well. But also we know services for, for a long time closed or went online and it's just not quite the same having your therapy session via Zoom as sitting in a room with someone. So there's been some real challenges there. I guess one of the key things for us is around people feeling that they're not unwell enough to get help and support. So that self-stigma that we've seen there. So people feeling like they couldn't go um, because it wasn't serious enough. And I guess this is why it's so important for early intervention. But also, again, this is where physical activity can play a, pre a, a prevention role, but also help in that early intervention space as well. So it has been a, a bit of a melting pot during this time. But also we've seen some really positive things as well. Research has shown that there's many positive ways people have coped and thrived through arts, creativity, through their family and relationships, accessing green space, reflecting on the meaning of life and what we want to do and where we want to be. And sort of this post-traumatic growth concept. So the Wellcome Trust has had some really good research about how the general public has actually become more resilient through this. So do join in on the chat on any ways that you've you know the positive things for you out of lockdown because whilst it's been a challenge we have for many had more time at home perhaps not had to do the commute tried something new um as well so really important that we, we reflect on those and are kind to ourselves as well so what is it around physical activity um in this space Oh, we have great chat there, green space, great sense of community in the walks. Brilliant to hear that. Excellent. Sorry. Um, so the role of physical activity, I feel like I'm preaching to the converted when I, I bring up the slides like this, but really just wanted to explore quickly um, how it has immediate benefits. Often with physical activity, with physical health outcomes, we have to wait weeks, months sometimes to see the benefit, but we can feel it through the release of the endorphins, the dopamine, the serotonin, almost instantly. It may not kick in every time, that runner's high, that sense of achievement, that lifting mood, but it's something that for many of us happens almost immediately, immediately at the end of the run. Physical activity is a stressor. So it releases the cortisol, the stress hormone, and over time builds up our tolerance to stress. So it helps us in our, our daily life through building up that, that stress tolerance. That feeling of self-esteem and achievement when we've, when we've mastered something, when we've, it's, you know, whatever it might be, walking, walking that mile or getting your 10,000 steps, um, really just, just helps with our, our mood and our, our sense of worth. And of course, helping us to sleep better. So sleep is a key protective factor for our mental health. You know, that feeling that we get when we've had a bad night's sleep, how it impacts on our, our mood and our, our well-being. And we know, providing we're not exercising too late in the day, that on the whole, it improves um, our sleep, sleep outcomes. And as I've mentioned already, it reduces the risk of depression by up to 30%. So through lockdown, um, we know it's been difficult. So in some ways, it's been... One way that we can leave the house has been to, to get active, but for other people, um, their mental health has worsened. You probably may not be able to see that on the right there, but 52% of children, young people, and 49% of adults said their mental health got worse by not being able to go to their, their sports clubs and their, their gyms in our first survey. And I think there's some really interesting insights um, that are coming through from our second survey that we we're about to release. Um, in, in terms of over half of children and adults actually said they used physical activity as a coping strategy, which I thought was really positive. You'd be unsurprised to know that spending time outside was one of the most popular coping mechanisms for children and young adults um, and adults. So three quarters of people um, coped in this way. But on the other hand, 76% of people said who previously played sport in a um, uh, either a team or in a venue, sort of as a leisure centre, said that not being able to do that impacted their mental health. So it jumped actually from 52 and 49% there in our first survey to 76% of people said that their mental health got worse because of not being able to do it. But we need to caveat this. There, there is a disparity. So people receiving in, in receipt of benefits were much less likely to cope through using physical activity um, or being uh, active outside and I think that's really interesting and it kind of points back to the um, 
uh, the inequalities, particularly around um, poverty, but also around uh, racialized communities and BAME audiences that we, we're doing some work on at the moment. So I think we need to be really mindful, and I know there's been some great projects to, to work with different people to, to get them active, um, and we're certainly learning around that. So, of course, it's a miracle cure, right? And it's often reported in this way um, um, in terms of the health benefits. But being active five times a week for 30 minutes is not as simple as, as taking a pill. It's not simple when there's all these challenges, particularly when you're made to feel lazy because you're not getting out and helping yourself. When you're too unwell to leave the house. When you can't exercise at home because there's no space, because you hoard. When your self-esteem is rock bottom and you just don't want to wake up in the morning. When you're shielding and you can't get out to get your food or your prescriptions, and so you can't even think about getting active. You've got no one to go with. It says bring a friend, but you've got no one to go with. You don't have any friends. You don't have family. Or at the opposite of the end of that spectrum, where exercise is the one thing that makes you feel good. So you do it at the expense of your relationships when you're injured, when you've got no energy, you're not fueled enough to sustain it. Um, when you're over exercising or training or when uh, you only exercise for once a day as per the regulations in the first two lockdowns but you stay out for eight hours at a time when the fun's gone and it's a chore and when exercise is the, the one thing in your life that you have control over so I just wanted to highlight those are some of the um uh, some of the feedback from some of our experts by experience that it's not that simple we throw it around as a miracle cure but it really is complicated so whilst it's a vital tool to have in our, in our kit bag, along with talking therapies, medication, peer support, it's really important that we approach it with caution and remember that whilst it's incredibly helpful and it has a real role to play, it's not a panacea. Um, we know from some research, um, we have a report called Get It Off Your Chest, which is a men's mental health report that men would prefer um, physical activity and talking therapy to medication. So we know it's also something that often goes in tandem with something else. So we've been working with our experts by experience to sort of really understand some of this and develop really sound guidance for the sector. So um, I will signpost later to our toolkit, which is guide two. Um, around the relationship between physical activity and mental health. And there we started to really explore over-exercising, exercise addiction, relative energy uh, disorder in sport, REDS, which is often seen at the perform performance side, but also this really challenging relationship around eating disorders and physical activity as well. So this is something that we're going to be doing more about in, in the sort of weeks and months ahead, around getting that balance, that healthy relationship promoting the importance of rest and active rest and balance and not letting things take over our lives. So we know lockdown has really exacerbated some of that over-exercising. So I'm going to stop talking now and hopefully I will share with you a quick video from our experts by experience before we get into some of our learnings from the projects. Bear with me. disorder and eating disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder and they affect my life quite considerably i've got a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder which means that i hallucinate in terms of hearing voices i mean one of the issues with 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 people who suffer with mental health is that it's more difficult for them to kind of accept if, if someone's being if they're being ignored or accept someone's rude to them i have postnatal depression and psychosis and then along the line, I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. The biggest barrier was not believing that everybody else was looking at me when I first went into the gym. And I think that's that goes for a lot of people without mental health problems as well, um, because it can be quite an intimidating atmosphere. Sometimes when you're not well and you have mental health issues can create multiple barriers for you in terms of being able to access the services and facilities that your local gym offers. I struggle to go out of the house. So, um, you know, there'll be days where I, I might go for weeks, you know, without going out, but um, I'm trying to motivate myself, but it, it is quite difficult. I was uh, sent to see a gym instructor uh, and I found it really um, 
embarrassing and being measured and weighed by by a man uh, who it felt very judgmental. Um, and um, then they sent me through a program for a gym. There was nobody to help introduce me to the gym. I found the gym environment. It was very loud, with loud music, very noisy. I felt afraid. I couldn't understand the um, instructions they'd given me for using the equipment. And when I asked for help, it was like, they said to me, well, we've shown you what, what's your problem. We haven't got time to be spending time showing you again. And then I felt a, a feeling of real fear about going back. Yeah, there's loads of things that people can do. They can um, have like a tour beforehand. So a, a gym near us has got a video tour on their website so you can go and see what the building is like beforehand, which for someone like me who struggles in buildings, that's really helpful. It can be very um, sort of high energy. If you're somebody who struggles being around people, going outside of four walls. Our local gym offers free swimming in order to improve their well-being. There is also a, a group for people with anxiety and that, or, 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 or are claustrophobic to be able to come with somebody or come at a time when the pool's not very busy. Things like staff training is very important so that we have an understanding of why people with mental health problems, what kind of things, you know, barriers they face, discrimination and stigmatisation because of the mental health. I went with somebody having a gym buddy and that helped as well. Um, but I found after a while I didn't need that gym buddy because it wasn't all about me in the gym. It was about me doing what I wanted to do and not what other people in the gym were doing. When I'm in the skate park, I'm Ellie who brings it in the skate park and shreds hard. I'm not Ellie with the mental health problems who is a, a complex case and a problem. So I think um, our expert by experience group um, really tell it how it is in terms of some of the barriers, but also in terms of some of the practical ways that people can make adaptations, simple things um, to really improve that experience and to make sure people can, can access um, physical activity. When we started our, our physical activity, activity journey, we, we talked to people at the heart of the programme um, to really understand what would help with their journey and, and how we could support them to overcome the barriers. And 70% of people told us that having a mental health problem made it more difficult to get started in physical activity. Lots of reasons were cited, you know, not being gym body ready, being embarrassed as we heard there about their, their body or their size. Nearly two thirds worried about taking part by themselves. And a third of um, people said they didn't want uh, people at the leisure centre to know about, about their mental health problem. Um, so we, we worked with um, experts by experience to sort of design and, and work through these barriers and some of the solutions. And we, we came up with a sort of a four corners approach um, to, to sort of understand what those barriers are. So physical, psychological, technical and, and social barriers. If I was in a room, I'd get you into breakout groups. If we had longer, really explore what some of these are. But just, just to briefly um, uh, go through some of them. And again, please do sort of jump in on, on, on the chat. Some of the physical barriers, as we can see there, was around um, the, the place and accessibility but particularly around things like the effects of medication. So weight gain um, um, from antidepressants, we know, and antipsychotic med uh, medicines have huge amounts of, of weight gain attached often, problems regulating temperature and sweating due to medication, but also due to anxiety, um, tiredness, um, and particularly that time of day of when sessions are on, people are on um, quite quite heavy medication, first thing in the morning could be a real challenge. So we do do some work with Parkrun, which is brilliant when it's up and running, but we know people find that really hard to, to get out that, that time in the morning. Um, but also sort of long-term health conditions. We know there's a lot of comorbidity, and I think there was some research out just yesterday about the impact of long-term health conditions and mental health. So we, we see that as, as, as a huge, huge challenge. So those are just some of the physical barriers. Um, psychological barriers around sort of the anxiety of, of going to a new place, difficulty with decision making, that fear of judgment as we heard on the video, and feeling like you're not good enough to take part. Um, an interesting one is around um, fear that benefits and personal budgets would be cut if you were seen to be getting better. 
Um, obviously, it's very different going to be physically active and do something to support your, your mental health and well-being to um, being able to uh, thrive in, in a working environment. And those two things, it's really important that we, we, we separate them, them out. And that was one of the, the challenges that people um, found initially. Technical barriers, things that you know many people without a mental health problem might might have concerns around, but also these were all exacerbated for people with mental health problems. So not understanding how how to play, the equipment, people not understanding their their needs, um, and the lack of trusted information and access points. And then finally, some of the social um, challenges that we heard there around having no one to go with and sessions sometimes being quite intimidating and thinking that you need to look a certain way to go to a gym and the, the stigma around sort of uh, mental health. Um, so it's really important that we think about the ways that we can support people to, to be physically active when they're, they're struggling with their, their mental health. And I guess to sort of recognise that many of the barriers are the same for people without a mental health problem, but they're often magnified um, when you do have, have a mental health problem. So we looked at all of the ways, all of the adaptations that you could make, um, and we came up with, um, with Excellence by Experience um, Care, which is sort of our approach to sort of adapting your, your delivery if you're a, a coach or a, or a provider to, to make your sessions more inclusive for, for everyone, but particularly for the people with mental health problems. So we have um, we do a lot of work with UK coaching. We have a really neat little animation and infographics around this. But it's really around these these four things. Um, there's lots of things we could do, but it, it kind of distills to these themes. So thinking about your, your coaching and your customer skills. See, I, I would really argue, having worked in disability sport for 20 years, um, that actually it's, it's about... Um, uh, your approach. A good coach, I really believe, can coach and work with anyone. So as it says there, being welcoming, talking about mental health, um, but providing that support, making yourself available if you can at the start and the end of the session to sort of offer that bit of like pastoral care and checking in with people is, is key. And awareness, having, having an understanding of the individual and knowing what's usual for them is really important so that we can support people when they're not feeling well and using our, our eyes, our ears, our listening skills so, so that we can spot when they, they might be struggling and they might be struggling with their mental health, they might be struggling because they're having a bad day or they can't do whatever drill you're doing, but it's spotting and being attuned um, to people. And of course, as I'm sure you would do, treating people with, with respect and treating everyone fairly and sort of being available to, to listen. We're not there as coaches to fix everyone and solve their problems, but being there to, to provide that support. Um, giving some people empathy, but also signposting um, to, to help and support because we're not expected to have all of the answers. So care is kind of the, the ethos or the, the principles that we use for, for sort of good practice um, in, in our projects and, and programmes and our work with partners. Okay, which leads me on to nicely sort of thinking about this range. So we talked about mental health being on a, on a spectrum um, and um, certainly there's a range of programmes and delivery styles and amazing projects that are happening up and down the country. So I just wanted to make you aware of some of the initiatives um, somewhere I can that are Surrey based. And hopefully Laura from uh, Sport in Mind, I'll, I'll be coming to you, Laura, if you're still there. So um, that's just a quick a quick warning. So thinking about that community space, those are the sessions that are open to everyone. Given those statistics, one in four adults, one in six children and young people um, have a mental health problem, you are already working with people that have a mental health diagnosis by the law of averages um, in your sessions. You may not just be aware of it. So using those care principles, um, I think are key and kind of being particularly aware as we, we come back from lockdown um, and sort of going forward over this next year or so, we know people have had a really hard time. So I think that's extra important that we, we make those sessions um, inclusive. Focusing on the active lifestyle and the feel good benefits, you know, this physical activity should be about how it makes us feel, it should be fun, it should be enjoyable. Um, and I think, you know, we often get lost, particularly when we're um, aiming for personal best or thinking about performance, that can get lost. And again, just thinking that can certainly be needed right now. A couple of examples there, and again, these are links, you can go in and have a look afterwards. 
but Run and Talk is a scheme with England Athletics. So we have um, mental health champions and ambassadors in running clubs up and down the country. Um, and we definitely have them in Surrey. I was just struggling to find the names of the clubs. So apologies if you're an ambassador or champion from uh, a club in Surrey. But they, they're there, they do run and talk um, campaigns. Some will deliver special uh, sort of sessions linked to mental health key moments deliver um, workshops just to help break down the stigma about mental health and kind of get running on on the agenda in, in running clubs we definitely have just appointed a mental health um, champion for um, FA for the referee department of the FA um, so each county has um, at least one if not two mental health champions and it's a pilot program so they're looking at how they support each other referees are slightly different environment because they're not in a fixed place all the time so support has been provided um, by phone uh, zoom teams um, but again a big part of it is around raising awareness of, of mental health and breaking down that stigma so there's lots of initiatives and please do if you've, you're running a program pop it in the chat and share with everyone targeted what we mean by that are sessions that are designed for people that have um, uh, have a mental health problem, whether that that's um, fully diagnosed or perhaps they want to improve their mental well-being through physical activity and join a mental well-being or mental health session. So there's um, a number of programmes, Get Set To Go, I'll come on to mental health peer support groups. So they are led by people who also have mental health problems. So Run, Talk, Run um, also now have Walk, Talk, Walk, and they've got a group in Guildford. Um, so meet at a set time um, and it's about supporting one another through physical activity. Mental Health Swims um, is an open water swimming project all over the country. Not yet in Surrey, I don't think, caveat, this is testing my geography, but it is in Kent, London and surrounding counties and they're always looking for people to, to set up and join the community. Mental Health Nates is a walking group. Um, uh, led by Bryony Gordon, um, who's a, a huge sort of mental health advocate. Mental health football, we think have peer support groups. So these are programmes, again, as I say, all with the outcome of improving mental health. So targeted specifically at people who either have a mental health problem or want to improve their mental health through, through this activity. Moving on to sort of primary care. Um, there are lots of resources around uh, for healthcare professionals um, to help them better understand um, the relationship between physical activity and mental health. So on the depression pathway, we have resources for having brief co conversations around physical activity for adults with depression, but for young people's mental health more broadly. Um, active monitoring is, is a um, programme that's led by Local Minds. Um, not in every area, but in many across the country. And physical activity is part of it's a self um, help resource that's a guided resource with um, uh, mental health practitioners. We've got IAP services, so include, uh, improving access to um, psychological therapies. We've got pilots going on at the moment um, in, in the South East, again, not quite in your area at the moment, to link up physical activity. Um, into the, that talking therapy um, CBT pathway and of course social prescribing I think we might have some social prescribing link workers um, on the call today which again for us is something I think social prescribing is a huge opportunity there's also some challenges link workers do a great job some can attend sessions for the, for the first session I certainly know from um, my experience with Jolly Joggers some people need a bit more support particularly that um, quite have um, severe and enduring needs and actually need more of a buddying system over a period of time to go, as we heard from Debbie on the film there, before she felt confident to go on her own. And then secondary care, which is just cutting off there. Um, inpatient sessions, um, we have an exercise professionals for mental health network, loads of case studies um, from everything from inpatient to secure, setting but we also have the fabulous sporty minds that kind of work at secondary and community targeted so um laura i just wondered if i could hand to you if you're still there to to say hello and explain what sporty mind does 
Still I am. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me to kind of have a little chat as well. So um, I won't take too much time, but um, just so you guys know, um, Sporting Mind is a, a charity. It's kind of, it's separate. It doesn't sit within mind. So we're kind of separate, but we work really closely together. And the idea of what we do um, is we started in Berkshire and we organise and deliver sport and physical activity sessions for anybody over 18 experiencing mental health problems. Um, and those are kind of out in the community. We do in patient sessions and then out in the community we run weekly sessions which are free to access delivered by qualified coaches um, to help people kind of on their way to recovery and they're really fun all of the stuff that hayley has been talking about is just so important to bring all of that in we've got volunteers with um, lived experience as well coming to the sessions as well so that friend friendly face when people get through the door um, and we are just expanding so we're expanding into slightly different areas and um, I'll be looking to start some kind of sessions and some, well some conversations first really about um, kind of working with you guys and where we can put sessions and where you know where there's need and what kind of sessions would work in each different area so um, Sam from uh, that does dancing I've had conversation about you this morning and I'm definitely going to want to kind of catch up with you about doing some stuff but um if anyone wants to kind of any more information i'll put my email in the chat and um, i'll be very happy to speak to you and hopefully work with you going forward as well so thank you very much thanks laura and sport in mind are fantastic and i think hopefully it's fair to say across the, the mental health sector we we all work together we've got a mental health group looking at physical activity and um i think there's, there's lots of sort of sharing amongst us so yeah great great laura's here today and excited to hear about your program in in surrey so certainly wanted to sort of explain it's a pathway so people always think straight away jump to inpatient but actually thinking about the sessions that you're running that now all the way through so it might be that um you you want to sort of adapt your delivery and and you're going to stay community and that's completely fine you just want to provide the best experience you can that's great we've all got mental health do it equally you might be thinking i i could fit or support or have an offer to make um in another area or want to link up with with laura for example so um just wanted to sort of give that that example of how it how it goes across and we're always sort of sharing and, and learning from from each other so just to touch a little bit on get get set to go so that's kind of our flagship peer support program um which supports people um uh, to get physically active through peer support so that's when people use their own experiences to support one another and um, it started in 2015 with support of sport england and since then 27 of our local minds have delivered it through um uh, through funding from Sport England and the EFL and really it was co-designed with people with lived experience so we, we have things like a, a service design blueprint so which takes people on that journey so if you're looking to set up something similar we can share that with you but really wanted to stress the importance of um, sort of using sort of involving people with um, personal experience and mental health problems to, to design your services Having that support for the volunteers, I think, was absolutely key. And just making sure that social environment, so it is about the physical activity, but actually, you know, it's about the, the tea and chat, the warm welcome, the community that builds around it and those friendship groups are, are absolutely key. So Loughborough University evaluated this in phase one and in phase two, we evaluated it internally and we're about to release the report um, in October around our findings. But it's it's key that people are at the heart of the programme. We're in the people business, really. Um, and I just wanted to share a few learnings for those of you that want to access the full academic report. It's 132 pages, but we also have a summary um, report and infographics as well. So we had over a thousand people take part in the survey and this followed people from baseline three, six and 12 months to really understand um, the, the impact on their mental well-being using the Warwick Edinburgh um, Mental Wellbeing Scale, but also on their physical activity levels and their social support. So importantly, we found that people became more active, they improved their social connectedness and it maintained or improved their, their mental wellbeing. We're still crunching the numbers for phase two um, and we used some slightly different measures. So we looked at the quality of life measure um, and you're probably thinking, what are all these measures? In our toolkit, we have a measurement outcome guide, which, which helps with these tools if you're looking to, to um, replicate this. But what we've really seen is the improvement in physical activity 
and increased intrinsic motivation. So people doing it because they enjoy it, they see the value, they can see the direct benefit to their mental health. And I think that is absolutely key. So I wanted to share some of the key active ingredients. So when you're thinking about um, programmes that you might be delivering in the future or your existing delivery, um, that lived in experience is key and peer support supporting one another was was vital people are in the same boat they understand it they might not have been through exactly the same thing but they've got empathy because they've they've been down a similar bar um understanding those barriers um at the start obviously the routine the structure including people like family and friends and support networks where appropriate but understanding not everyone has them so being really sort of empathetic towards people and making sure, I've said it a couple of times, we focus on fun and enjoyment so that people can see those Im immediate benefits. What we found was that people that took part in the programme um, uh, were able to keep walking even when their mental health took a dip. So people were starting to see walking as something they could do in their daily lives. So even when they couldn't make it to the swim session or the multi-sport, that walking was something that they could benefit from. And I think that's that's a key outcome for us, that we all need to move more for our, our mental health. And if we can give people that tool, it's, it's something vital in terms of self-management. And um, in terms of sort of more for the sector, um, the two strong recommendations were around sport and mental health working together. And I feel like I'm a matchmaker in my job. A lot of what I do is bring people together and facilitate those relationships because they are absolutely key. We're not expecting um, sports people to be mental health experts. We're not expecting mental health people to be sports experts. When we come together, then it's, it's a great partnership. But also around um, the programme, we developed a training package around mental health awareness, specifically for sport and physical activity, to help people understand the signs and symptoms and um, when to sign post people are um, off. And also their boundaries as well. So we delivered this face to face, we co-designed it, our trainers all had lived experience. And over the time, we were asked to take this online and um, to make it available to, to thousands of, of people. So just some food for thought in terms of our, our learnings there. And I guess really conscious of time, um, a bit of a, a thought starter rhetorical question for you guys to so just think about how some of this might apply in your setting and what steps you can make to, to become that bit more inclusive wherever you are on that um, community um, pathway. Okay. So we've got about 10 minutes left. So I think quite keen to signpost to some resources before we get into some questions and answers. So one of the things we've been thinking about and being asked a lot of questions about is this return to play. And we know some sessions have restarted, um, leisure centres are now open again, which is, is brilliant to hear. But we also know people with long term health conditions and people with mental health problems have had extra anxieties about returning to physical activity. So we've seen some great good practice around hybrid delivery. So people offering, continuing to offer online or virtual sessions alongside face-to-face -face sessions um, as well. So we've been doing lots of work with this and understanding the support people want. Um, you can see the tips there around, you know, clear communication being key. You know, it's quite um, challenging when we've been told to stay home for so long. And then if you struggle with social anxiety, you've not been around people, and then you're going out for the first time, actually smaller groups and things can really help people. And, giving people as much information about the safeguards that you put in place to sort of reassure them and take away the fear factor. Absolutely, um, absolutely key. Being person-centred where we can, understand that you can't adapt to everything, to everyone, and sometimes people are running classes that are back to back, but where we can sort of trying to have that, that person-centred, non-judgmental um, ethos. Um, this was just a quote that sort of really resonated about sort of people's anxiety around. So you know that feeling when you're rocking on the back of your chair and suddenly for a split second, you feel you're about to fall and you get that feeling in your chest. Imagine that split second being frozen in time and lodged in your chest for minutes, hours, days. And imagine it with the sense of impending doom and dread sticking around too. But sometimes you don't even know why. And that was just someone's experience around sort of returning um, back out of lockdown as, as lockdown easing. So just wanted to sort of share, share that with you. 
So what have we done? What resources have we got? Well, we've got lots of resources um, online. So we've developed resources both for um, supporting individuals, uh, the workforce and uh, participants. Um, so we have guides um, available on our web pages, uh, mind.org.uk forward slash sport. But also we've teamed up with an organisation called Believe Perform to develop some infographics. So again, this is all linked. You can go, go ahead and download those when we, we, sh uh, when we share it with you. Um, and also they've done resources around um, signposting and mental health, some really good sort of posters. Um, and for us, it was really important that we brought our lived experience and our experts by experience voice together with Believe Perform, who are sort of psychologists, and again, teamed up together to create some resources that we think will really help um, the sector. So there's some resources there to access. Um, five Ways to Wellbeing. Some of you will be incredibly well versed in, in Five Ways to Wellbeing, um, but these are, we think of them as our fruit and veg uh, a day for our mental health. We all know what our five a day is when it comes to fruit and veg. Whether we eat it is another story. Um, but just thinking about self-care is, is really important. Um, and I'm not going to go through this in matters um, of detail, but just thinking about sort of connections at this time, but also disconnecting. Being on Zoom constantly has been a challenge um, for, for many of us. Um, focusing on the, the small and simple things, that taking notice, that gratitude, remembering the things that give you joy. And I guess just a flag that giving, uh, doing good makes us feel good and acts of kindness can make us feel happier. So thinking about how we can use five ways of, to wellbeing for ourselves, but also for our participants, our volunteers. Um, we've got lots of resources around them to now, sports toolkits, and um, lots of organisations have been doing amazing things during lockdown to support one another, which I think has been really positive. Next thing I want to mention was I've already alluded to the training course and um, so mental health awareness for sport. Oh, mental health awareness for sport and physical activity is an e-learning course um, which has been sort of honed over time and uh, based on experts by experience. Um, and it's available from UK coaching. So it, we've reached thousands of people. I'm really sad if you didn't access it last summer when it was free. It is only £12 per person um, and there's a range of discounts if you're looking to book by. But I guess for us, it's really important that it, it has been designed by experts, by experience um, and the sports sector. So it's really about what are the barriers, how to overcome them, signs and symptoms and, and signposting. So if you were sat there today wishing that you knew more about mental health diagnosis, for example, that course, along with many others like mental health first aid and mental health awareness, will um, help to um, increase your understanding. I guess this just gives it in a sport and physical activity um, setting. And then before we go to questions, a couple more slides, I promise. Um, things that are tailored for the sports sector. So we, we have an email um, that's monthly. We have regional networks that bring together sports and mental health organisations to share learning, to deliver training. And we have a Southeast um, network. And then our toolkit launched a few weeks ago. So we have 10 guides with case studies and tools. So it covers everything from that relationship between physical activity and mental health, measuring outcomes. So if you're putting together a project plan, um, supporting volunteers, role descriptions, uh, lots of things in there. Um, and also um, we've taken all of our learning from our champion scheme to also create a toolkit for the sports sector. So if you're thinking, oh, I wanna, I wanna set up a champion scheme for my sport or my local area, again, everything, one-stop shop is available there. If you're coming at this more from a workplace internal point of view, then um, we again have resources for, for the workplace to help you really look at your, your policies around mental health um, and how you can get the best out of people and support them to thrive. So everyone from working with the English Institute of Sport case studies in there to swimming, all sorts of organisations and things that you can take. Like if you're writing a survey, you can take some of our questions and, and pop them in. So if you're coming at this from a workplace point of view, lots of support is there available. And of course, we have our information pages and our um, helplines available um, as well. So if you know someone that's struggling with their mental health, it's really important that they, they reach out to someone that they trust, 
GP and healthcare providers, NHS 111, and lots of listening services. And I know it can be really tricky to find what's available near you. So the Hub of Hope is a great resource, which is linked there. So you can go in and have a look at, have a play with all these links. Um, but that includes statutory, but also voluntary services um, as well. And I'll just leave that quote up for a second whilst I guess um, you formulate any questions that you have before we do the wrap up. Appreciate I've thrown a lot of information at you right now. So I'm gonna just stop the share, if that's okay with everyone. That quote is from John, one of our Jolly Juggers. Thanks, Hayley, that was great. I'm just having a look at the chat. There's nothing directly in the chat at the moment, just a couple of links and contacts um, from local organisations, which is great, promoting what they're doing in their activities. Um, and as Hayley kind of showed within her presentation today, there's so much support and information out there. It's just knowing where to go. So please do share what activities and opportunities you have locally with us and each other. Um, I will send around a copy of the slides and uh, the links after today's presentation, so you'll all get a copy of those. Um, also, just as a general quick feedback point of view, if you wouldn't mind just answering the one question poll that I've just popped up, um, just to help us in terms of our whole lunchtime learning series, that would be great. Um, and then, yeah, do shout, unmute if you have any questions for Hayley or pop them in the chat. If not, then please feel free to get in touch with us directly. There are loads of great opportunities within Surrey via the Surrey Virtual Wellbeing Hub through the contacts mentioned today. So yeah, please, please do reach out. Thanks so much, Hayley. Fantastic. Well, just wanted to say thank you for having me and just bringing us back to the why really. I guess physical activity can change lives, but really important that we remember it in the context of an individual's life, um, ensure that it's person-centered, it's balanced. It can be huge, hugely beneficial, but if it's not balanced, it can become a problem. We've all got a, um, a role to create an environment that we care for people, so thinking about our coaching and customer skills, our awareness, our respect and our empathy. And, you know, we are in the middle of a global pandemic and it's going to have a, a lasting impact. So we need to think about putting our own oxygen mask on first before we help others. But thank you for, for coming along today. And yeah, happy to take any any further questions um, and say access the resources. There's lots of support out there um, for you.